Thanks for taking the time to join our uh, Hangout today. You may have already downloaded and read the Forrester Consulting Report, uh, ThoughtWorks commissioned, entitled Continuous Delivery, a Maturity Assessment Model. The research based on the results of 325 in-depth surveys with IT and business professionals across the US, UK, and Australia was focused on evaluating current software delivery processes. The report clearly states that business leaders continue to be frustrated with software delivery. Many are looking for answers. Through our conversations today, we aim to provide some insight. I'd like to introduce uh, two of our thought workers joining us today. First, we have Tim Brown. He's a principal consultant and the America's practice lead for continuous delivery based in San Francisco. We also have Jez Humble. He is a principal consultant and co-author of Continuous Delivery, uh, also based in San Francisco. Um, we may have Joanne Molesky also uh, joining in after we get started. She is, our, uh, she is an IT risk and compliance specialist and a global practice lead for Continuous Delivery, and she's based in Australia, so uh, very early for her this morning. Now that we have those introductions out of the way, let's get the conversation started. Uh, feel free to submit some questions in the comment section on the screen. We'll start out by tossing to Tim. So Tim, what did you find most interesting about this Forrester report on continuous delivery? The, there's a couple things that stick out, but probably the most interesting was the disparity between the business's view of IT and the IT's view of the relationship between business. Um, roughly, you know, 40% of the business leaders thought that IT was working as a partner with them and worked for actually equal amounts as order takers or just some kind of uh, IT as a service, the utility. While around 60% of the, the IT leaders view they were in a full partnership. And that's a huge disparity. So. Yeah. That, and I think, you know, this is strange because the whole principle of the uh, Agile manifesto is around collaboration, collaboration between yeah. businesses and IT. So, you know, here we are in 2013, and we're still in a situation where you know IT is treated as you know a, a service that the business can go to. And the problem is that drives all these behaviours, like the business coming out with these huge requirements documents, then get tossed over the wall to IT to, to build. And this idea that you know actually working out the requirements is the hard bit. And once you've done that, you know these kind of people who are fungible and you know replaceable then just go and do the easy work of actually building it as if we're building trust or something. And that those requirements aren't changing. And no, we won't discover anything in the process of building it. It might change the requirements. That can never <laughs> so you know that that's kind of depressing. It is depressing. I mean, um, yeah. you think it's different, but what, what did you find? What was if I chose that one, what, what was your kind of hot button? Okay, the thing that particularly bothered me is uh, um, there's this figure, figure five. Oh no, sorry, figure eight. Decision by committee is how most firms develop software services. So, forty. I mean, there's if you look at something like nine plus thirteen percent is opinion of the person with the highest salary wins out, or no systematic approach. So that's twenty percent of people who, when they're deciding what they're going to build, they don't have a systematic approach, or whoever's paid the most decides. That's you not know, systematic. No. And then, you know, 47%, which is nearly half, obviously, is a committee decides. So if we look at actually people doing financial modeling, actually using an economic model on deciding what to build, that's 24% of people. And then, you know, that, that was there one where, you know, we actually gather feedback from users? Oh, that, that's a different thing. That, that's a different one. But so a very... Uh, Less than a quarter of the people are actually using any kind of financial model in order to work out what to build. So we're still using this kind of Soviet central model for deciding what we're going to build and then starting these huge projects that are taking, you know, six to 12 months is the, 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 uh, the mode, the most popular choice to build. So, you know, how, how do you innovate in this model? You, you can't, you can't. I mean, this actually goes back to while over half the software we build in, in, as an industry right now is not used. It's rarely or ever used. It's, it's, we have no measure of, or very few people actually measuring what they're building, this driving value, and they're making proper investments. It's sad. It's sad. And what it also kind of drives into this stuff, so you, you pointed out that it takes them, like roughly 30% of the people are, are kind of aiming for six to 12 month windows, but well over another 
40% are 12 months or longer. That's pretty, that's pretty significant. And it, when I look at this, and it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me in some cases, is that we've got a third of our teams out there working across the world that are doing continuous integration, a core practice that's been out there for a decade. Um, this, is, this is figure nine. Figure nine, yes. This right. is looking at the, the list of practices that people are actually using. Um, and you know, the most common one that people are using is source control. So I was delighted to hear that people are actually using source control. Source control 40% of the time. 40% of the time, which is you know, using it daily. Uh, and then 7% of people are not using source control at all. I wonder what they're building. That's, yeah. I hope it's not software. I hope it's not software as well. So that's, that's, re that's the most common process uh, practice that people are actually using. But you know, CI is, is where do we have CI? CI is about third from the top. Yeah. Continuous integration. So 29% of people are doing continuous integration at least daily. Sure. But I think there's an interesting thing in this, though. When we look and we talk to people, we can see that there's a growing trend to modernize application architectures and build new modern ap uh, applications and systems that solve business problems. And a lot of these are cloud-based. Now, the interesting thing is if you look at the same figure nine, down towards the bottom, the, the, the last two from the bottom, um, about development operations, automated the deployment process, and they're also using cloud services. Look at that. 17% are using cloud services daily. They're also the ones that have automated the deployment. They're also practicing CI. There's a trend. Our, our movers and shakers are doing these things, and they're taking sustainable advantage. So there's a significant proportion of people who are starting to do this. Um, I mean, what's worrying to me is that 17% of people are using, you know, cloud services on a daily basis, and 40% of people are using version control. I mean, it's, it's still, these practices are not nearly as widespread as, as we would like to be seeing in 2013. But, you know, it's, the other surprising thing is there's not a big difference between the people who are starting to use that and the people who are using um, source control. So there's a really long tail here of people who are huge, just not picked up much of this stuff at all. So there's lots of room for improvement. There is That's lots the good of news. <laughs> Some of this stuff is low hanging. We can get started. It won't be that hard. Um, so I guess the other thing that we should talk about, oh, the other, the other one I wanted to talk about is figure 11. Gathering feedback is still a manual process. So we wanted to see, I mean, obviously, the new hotness is the lean startup and this idea of actually hypothesis-driven delivery, the idea that you come up with a small experiment to test whether a feature is valuable and based on the data you gather from that, um, build out uh, new work rather than this kind of very phase gate traditional process. So, you know, we asked, the, the, <coughs> the, the key question was, you know, how many people are using automated monitoring and analytics to watch parts of our services and products that customers are using and then further develop those features? You know, we sometimes introduce new features as an experiment and watch whether customers or users adopt them and how. So 40 out of 160, that's 25% again, just under 25% are actually doing this. So that, that's pretty good. That's exciting. That's very exciting. Um, but, you know, still the vast majority of people, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more kind of phase gatey, traditional requirements gathering kind of thing. Um, so I guess it, it's, it's kind of almost as if there's kind of this long tail and then there's this like bang when it's suddenly there's this group of about 20% of the people it's all to who are doing all this really new, interesting stuff. That's actually interesting. 20%. Um, what was on figure four, wasn't it, where we talked about release windows? So 30% of respondents are six months or less. And of that 30%, 8% are fewer than three months. I think that's the same people. I think that's the crossover. The ones that are changing things and getting out there and being able to do this are the ones that can iterate faster. It's, it's, the writing's on the wall. Right. It would be nice to get some correlations between these days. Yeah. Things, yeah. I wonder what other people are saying. Yeah. Do we have... Questions, Questions? Commentary? Thoughts? <coughs> Anyone on Twitter? We do have a couple of Twitter responses. Do we? What are people saying? I wonder what they are building. He's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> So I guess the other thing we should talk about is the maturity model. Um, so there's a ton of maturity models on the internet. We actually put a continuous delivery maturity model into the continuous delivery book. It's there in the final chapter. So you know, I imagine there's a pretty steep drop-off of readers who actually get to the final chapter. But if you get there, it's there. 
And then since then, we've kind of expanded it, we use it to do assessments. Companies hire Forex to come in and do an assessment, look at where you are now, where you want to go, and help you put together a plan to get from A to B. And then one of the primary tools we use to drive out that assessment is, is a maturity model. And it got to the stage where we had like eight different axes from you know CI maturity to environment management to our, our kind of joker card, which is um, organizational alignment. Organizational alignment. Because even if you do really well in continuous integration and, and environment management, no one does well in organizational alignment. You know, it's the whole DevOps thing, which is you know, DevOps still, and what's our business IT relationship? Right. They all come together. Right. Which we're seeing in this report. But what we wanted to do is kind of just come up with a very simple model. So we've got this maturity model that goes from one to five, um, and there's just one axis. Uh, and the idea is that it's just a very simple way to look at, you know, and it wasn't just about the technical practices of continuous delivery. It's also about, you know, are you doing hypothesis-driven delivery? Are you actually gathering real data from users on what which of your features they're actually finding valuable and running experiments in production um, to, to try and learn more uh, about your customers and, and what they value? So you kind of put the continuous design and continuous delivery stuff together into this maturity model. Uh, and I guess maybe we should talk over it for a, for a few minutes. So, you know, we start with level one, which is optimistically called the initial level. Um, and the kind of the tagline of that is a few smart people performing heroics. And so the That's characteristics of this, uh, and this is very common, you know, a few people are the people who are working the crazy hours to get the release out of the door and working weekends and and, and, and doing nutty things to try and get the software actually released to users every six months or a year, whatever. Yeah. And usually the people performing the heroics are the people who messed it up in the first place and made it hard to deploy. Key, I like that some of the kind of the, the key things you can see here is the reliance on manual testing after development. I mean, I've met with people recently that still they can't go faster because they have you know, three weeks of manual regressions. It's interesting. And this is all pain. This, right. is a mass, this is mass amounts of pain in this level. And they have to integrate everything before they can even start testing. So you're maybe developing in these nice iterative cycles, but then you have to integrate everything and then test it before you can get it anywhere near production. And that's a manual process. That happens once development is complete. People can't get production-like test environments easily to run integrated tests in. Uh, that's a manual process. Deployment is manual. There's a whole bunch of kind of, kind of technical and process-related things you, you've kind of got listed out here. But the one that sticks out to me, too, is that certain times people are actually managed to, to different goals that brings them into conflict. Um, which do you think is higher priority? Is it more important to get people started off on fixing the technical aspects or trying to align with the management goals, how they're measured? So uh, the problem is it's really hard to change the organizational culture. So that's probably the most important thing. I mean, this is what DevOps focuses on is how do we create a mindset and a culture where we, we you know, we're all focused on continuous delivery of valuable software? Yes. Um, but, and that's really hard to do. And I think part of the problem is, you know, it, it's going to be very difficult to transform a whole organization like that. And we don't see that. People don't succeed at transforming the whole organization in a small amount of time. So I think the first step is building up trust between dev and ops. And in order to build up trust between dev and ops, it has to be dev that moves first and actually puts in continuous integration and automated testing as a way to actually prove that the software that they're giving to ops is actually going to be production ready and releasable and supportable. So I think the first step in building up trust is developers actually taking responsibility for making sure their software is integrated and tested and, and deployable rather than kind of throwing horrible. That makes sense to me. So it's like do some of the basics, get some trust gathered from that, lift the bar, if you will, and then we can start actually worrying about culture and the, broad, the broader things, which allow us to accelerate through these other levels much faster. Right, which moves us on to level two, you know, the, the adaptive delivery process, where um, you know we start having things like business participating in development activities, some level of automated acceptance <coughs> testing. So you know, not all the testing is manual. We can get production-like testing environments earlier on. There's some scripting, so we can build packages from version control, configure environments with some level of automation, and that enables you to Know, produce integrated deployable software at the end of every sprint, for example. So actually, what you just covered also kind of pops into one of our first questions that arose, which is, uh, do you think the lag in implementing CD is a cultural lack to embrace the concepts, or more related to the large technical debt of uh, legacy systems and the cost to implement? So in these cases, lots of times people trying to do automated tests, it's difficult for them, it costs a lot. 
Um, and then, but this is what all the problems with continuous delivery fundamentally come back to one of two things. It's cultural or architectural. Yes. So which comes first? And you know, based on the premise that you're not going to be able to build up trust until you're able to actually validate the software you're building, I think kind of the architectural one comes first. You know, deployability and testability are architectural constraints. Absolutely. They're things that you have to think about as you're building your software. So, and retrofitting testability, the ability to test, do acceptance tests on development workstations, for example, the ability to deploy your software into a production-like environment easily and repeatedly so that developers can reproduce bugs on their development environments. These are things you've got to think about architecturally and you need to do that so that you can start doing continuous integration and so that you can start doing automated testing so that you can then start building up trust. So I would actually say that people actually have a pretty good, pretty good chance here to catch up. Um, a lot of the companies that I've seen in the last you know, 18 months are doing cloud initiatives. They're doing certain little edge pieces where they're pushing out their application extending it into new ways of working with customers on the internet. So when they're doing this, there's generally some amount of architectural shifts that have to happen. Maybe they can start making inroads on this by applying practices to that first piece, developing success and continuing on. I'm always seeing that there's this term that's recently come into the lexicon of shadow IT, right? Yes. <laughs> so people who are starting to, you know, so some of this, you know, 17 whatever percent of people were still <coughs> using cloud stuff, I'm betting some proportion of that is shadow IT. Shadow you know? IT. Business units, building stuff, pushing into the cloud, bypassing the centralized IT organization in order to be able to get stuff out there more quickly. Sounds like reminiscent of the uh, kind of dark agile that was happening you know, half a dozen years ago. Right. Where people are doing agile but just not telling on about it. Nice. You know. I like to see that. So, so maybe this is maybe this is a few, maybe it's shadow CD. Shadow CD. But then, yes. You know, the sensible thing to do is to be able to take the people who are doing that and then take those people and see them through the rest of the organization. You know, the, the point is, if you're doing shadow IT and you're gathering the skills necessary, the big problem is a skills lack. A lack of skills in understanding how to do automated testing, continuous integration, um, automation of deployment, sure. all this kind of thing. But if you've got people doing it, you've got skills, now you just have to focus the collaboration, split them up, seed them to new teams, and right. get it going. And crucially, not put them into a DevOps team, oh, yes. whose job it is to you know, fix all the problems uh, an organizational silo to fix an organizational silo problem. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem with that is, of course, those people then end up being the people who know this stuff, and that knowledge doesn't get seeded out through the rest of the organization. And knowledge development is a big part of this. I think you know the, the cultural change is created by growing people in the organization, mm -hmm. help, doing skills development, helping people understand how to do this stuff, making it safe for people to do this stuff. So you have to have some people who actually know how to do things like test-driven development, continuous integration, um, cloud-based architecture, um, all these different things, and, and focus on having them teaching the other people in the organization how to do it and making it safe for them to do it. Uh, and then, you know, level three, uh, building quality into the process. This is where we get to continuous integration, where continuous integration is defined as everyone checking into Trunk at least once a day uh, and then working off working off mainline, doing mainline-based development. Um, that requires a good level of automated testing to actually make sure that you can detect defects quickly. Um, you need to be able to provision integrated environments in a push-button way. Um, and then, the crucial thing, you can't say you're done with a piece of work until it's deployable, uh, which means you have automated tests running in a production-like environment that validate that the software actually works. And then the other key change is the relationship between test and dev, oh, which yeah. is that you know this is only possible if dev and test are co-located, working together, and the developers don't declare dev complete unless they have automated test passing that, that demonstrate the software they built actually yeah, works. Proves the business value. You know, actually, the rudimentary pieces that you're going to measure. With. Right. So yeah. So you can't do this if test is a separate department working in a separate building um, or in a separate country. So, so yeah. you're probably pretty. Pretty reliable, at least on the delivery windows in this at this stage, I would say. Yeah, I mean, cadence is pretty well defined. It may not be what the business wants, but we're, we're pretty repeatable. Yeah, repeatable release process. So, question two: Do you think the ERP vendors? Do you think the ERP vendors are doing enough to support the CD approaches? Uh, many are using similar technologies as custom software development, but they're enabling. But are they enabling the tools enough, or encouraging cartel-like behavior with their third parties? 
we would never accuse uh, cartel custom off the software custom off the shelf software vendors of operating cartels. That would that would be outrageous. Um, I, you know, it's still a bit of a ghetto out there. It's it's a ghetto. Um, I was being more of a snake, and then in a bad sense, it's my is that there's a head and a tail. I think many of the the kind of forward-leading ERP vendors that are actually starting to offer software service solutions feel like they're moving more into the CD space. They're giving ways to mock out elements of the system so they can people can test and do some things without having to test the whole big ball of mud. While some of the old the, the legacy on-premise software it still feels like the legacy on-premise software with no ability to test it unless you're testing the entire world. I mean, SAP, for example, they have this concept of transports. There, is, there are ways to do deployments in an automated way uh, and migrations in an automated way. Um, and we know that there are some people out there doing it. Um, but again, I think the problem is you have to design the system with that in mind. And you have to, uh, you know, you have to employ good practices around how you actually do that and the knowledge and the skills around how you build systems around custom off the shelf software in such uh, in commercial off the shelf software in such a way that you can actually do the deployments and migrations in an automated way. A lot of that is missing. And the problem is, you know, if you're not careful to specify that up front uh, and think about that from the beginning, it's super hard to retrofit. So I think, you know, part of the problem is, you know, if you're if you're using commercial off-the-shelf software, if you're using ERP systems, you shouldn't be customizing them. If you need, to, you should be <coughs> changing your business process to match what the tool does off the shelf. And if you can't do that, then what that means is the business process that you're trying to use the software for is a strategic one. And you should probably be building custom software to deliver stuff that's strategic. And that will only be a small percentage of your IT software portfolio, but you should be really careful about that. The, the, the large proportion of your portfolio, the stuff that is you're using custom off the shelf, uh, commercial off the shelf software to, to run, that stuff should be you shouldn't be customizing it. Change your process to match what the software does, because the process isn't what's differentiating differentiating you the customer. So there has to be a lot of thought that goes in at the IT portfolio level around what are we going to use custom software for? What are we going to use uh, commercial off the shelf software for? Uh, and, and make you don't get customization where it's not appropriate. Actually, I would go a little step further on that too. If I was actually involved with a, a software selection right now of a ERP or similar kind of chunk of uh, of software I'm going to buy commercially, I know that I'm not going. It's not an island. It's not going to sit off by itself and just work off in the corner. It's something I have to tie to my business processes and other systems. I would actually be asking the vendors how they go about. What's their testing philosophy? How do we tie this together? And which portion of their code do they? You know, you can't ask what do you, do you plan for testability. No, you have to ask them some edge questions about how they approach testing, how they support us doing testing and integrate this, and try to, to find a vendor that actually is testable and thinks about testability, and thinks about you know quantization and incrementalism, so that we can actually be more successful when we implement the product. So someone on Twitter has asked me, what about the database team? This is Andres Robelino. What about the database team? Uh, in the context of integrating DevOps, they're part of the team. We should actually have it. We need to, the problem with the database team has been the, the problem with every other specialist is that they're uh, a precious commodity. We need to share that knowledge, drive more collaboration, so that developers actually start writing, you know, SQL scripts. They start writing things. It doesn't say you, mean, you don't have a specialist that reviews it. If you're going to be, you know, uh, turn into a table scan over 200 million rows, you've got a problem. But developers should know how to do things well. And go ahead. the reason the DBAs hate the developers is because the, the developers make changes and don't run query optimization plans, uh, don't do query uh, execution plans, and find out that it's going to cause a hundred times degradation of performance in production, or they <laughs> forget to add an index, or they add an index and the index takes 24 hours to actually add to the table. And so if developers can get feedback on that fast, then they can actually discover those problems quicker, fix the problems before it ever gets to production, and then the DBAs won't hate them anymore. A lot of the problems in enterprises are caused by silos whereby people can't actually learn what the consequences of their actions are. And they, developers often aren't exposed to these things. So we need a way to make it so that you know, if you do something dumb, 
like forgetting to add an index or adding an index that takes 24 hours to actually put in place, you get feedback on that quickly so that you can fix it. And that requires some level of collaboration between the DBAs and the ops folk and the developers to put those feedback mechanisms in place. If they, I mean, if the developers don't know what they're doing wrong, and they can't know what they're doing wrong, they can't get better. So this is the responsibility of ops, is to provide the tools to dev to actually enable dev to get better. Right. So what you're, another way to paraphrase what you just said, and this is where I, the way I view you know, DBAs and data architects, is the, this is a classic DevOps problem. You know, we actually have to have developers feel the pain of what's going on in production and care about how their applications work if we want to think the world to change. So this goes back to collaboration. DevOps was, you know, that whole DevOps culture came about trying to realize that we're all solving the same problem together. Which brings us nicely to level four on the maturity model. Actually, hold on. Before we do level four, we actually have another question. And okay. I think this is one that we like to disagree on sometimes. Okay. The question is, is Agile a prerequisite for CD for large applications that have been traditionally developed using the waterfall model? So what do you mean by Agile? I, I see they've used a large A. Ooh, capital Agile. So capital Agile. So if, if you mean Scrum, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think a lot of these problems are architectural problems. Um, I think, you know, and, and the key thing here is you know, it's possible to incrementally move a system to, a, to an architecture where it's more easily testable and deployable. There's a pattern that Martin Fowler writes up on his blog called the Strangler Application Pattern. And the idea is it's like in Brazil, you have these trees where there's a vine that grows up, a fig, fig vine that grows up and strangles the tree eventually. And the idea is that you know you take a system that's very monolithic, big ball of mud, and when new requirements come in, you build them using TDD, using you know modern technology, just for that bit, and it talks to the rest of the system, the existing system, um, to, to get the stuff it needs. But all new functionality is built using you know TDD, CI, um, best practices. Yeah, good practices around software development. Um, so I think it's possible to do that incrementally. I, I think. Uh, I've actually seen this actually happen before. We, we, it's pretty clear that continuous delivery is a small batch optimized process. The small batch, is, it's really, really good at that. It doesn't mean that you can't get value out of it if you're doing large batch. That it does mean that the large batch does hurt. You won't get the full value of CD. And I've, been worked, I've worked with one large software provider that kind of learned this. They started off down the CD path and ended up backing into Agile. They started trying to do CD. They found it difficult. They saw some incremental value. And then one day I walked in and they had 22 Scrum teams going. Plus, you know, doing TDD and learning all their other stuff. So there's hope, definitely. It is possible to do it. Uh, question four, do you have any pointers for other practices next to trunk-based development and branch by abstraction to support continuous delivery? I think um, the other one that's really important is the distinction between deployment and release. Ah, yes. Um, and this is particularly applicable to software as a service. Uh, it doesn't really apply to user-installed software or to embedded systems. But for software as a service, this idea that actually we can be deploying multiple times a day, but we're not releasing new features to users multiple times a day. So deploy means take a build, put it into an environment. Release means making features available to users. And normally, you know, traditionally, we have achieved release by deployment. But actually, they're two independent activities. And what you see people like. Uh, Facebook and Etsy and Amazon doing is they're deploying all the time, but they're deploying features dark. The features are there in production, but they're switched off. No one can see them. And then what you can do is turn up a knob and expose those features to a small set of test users, run some experiments, gather some data, then iterate a bit on the features. And then when you're ready and you're sure they're going to behave in the way you're expecting or they're going to achieve the expected customer outcome, then you dial them up to 100%. But that's a purely, that's achieved, I mean, the business is doing that. And that's completely independent of deploying. You know, you can actually deploy the stuff into production long before it's available. We were doing some work for um, a website for an airline, uh, and they were merging with another airline. And we had the stuff that was through the other airline in production, but it was switched off for, for ages. Uh, and what that meant is when, we were, when they were ready to actually launch the combined version of the system, you know, they could, they could turn that stuff on. But crucially, it wasn't sitting in a branch, unmerged, rotting, so that when they, were, when they were ready to launch it, they would have to merge and integrate and test. It was already in production, and they could just turn it on at any time. And it was always merged and known to be working and tested all the time, any time a deployment went out. So this idea of launching stuff dark 
and then gradually turning up the dial. And I do want to kind of come back to the continuous delivery maturity model sure. at this point. I mean, we've level... got a couple more questions we can cover towards later. Yeah, yeah. Level four, quality, quantitatively managed, the next level up, we talk specifically about having cross functional, end to end product centric teams. And you can't do release on demand without you know, cross functional teams. And that, you know, this, this is, again, we've been talking about this for years. Scrum talks about it. Amazon has two pieces of teams. This is more than a decade people have been talking about the importance of cross-functional teams. It doesn't mean you get rid of specialization. There's still specialists. Those specialists might not work 100% of the time on the teams, but the job of the specialists is to train up the people on the teams to, to gain those skills. So they're mentors. They're mentors. Mentors and advisors to a to team to help them be successful. Right. And you know, one of the kind of fights that we saw in the last year was this fight between DevOps and NoOps. And NOPS is this very provocative term that we're going to get rid of operations. Well, that's not true. You still need operations experience on cross-functional product teams. It's just not centralized. It's on the team. So you need more ops skills and more ops people. And you know what you need to do is make sure that the ops people are training up the people on the teams to understand how to build software that actually works Scales in production, works in product. is available, you know, secure. The whole kind of site reliability engineering that we see in certain companies popping up. That's, right. a great, that's a great use of smart ops people or dev people that really know ops. And, and you know, so site reliability engineers in Google, the key thing is you can only hand a service over to a site reliability engineer in Google once it's already in production and it's not getting changed very often. And at that point, you can hand it off. And the moment there's a problem with it, they hand it straight back to the people who built it. So it's not the job of the SREs to pick up the nasty pile of, no. you know, <clears throat> Poop that has been thrown over the wall to them and try and make that work. It's, you know, we're going to maintain it while you're uh, doing your thing. And then, so level five, this is where we talk about hypothesis driven delivery. Uh, all new requirements describe how the value of the feature will be measured. Product teams are responsible in, for implementing metrics to gather data through techniques such as A B testing. Systems are architected with continuous deployment in mind, supporting patterns such as dark launching to decouple deployments from release. And database changes are decoupled from application deployments. This was the follow-up tweet I got from the guy who asked about databases. Uh, you know, he says it's never a never-ending battle trying to convince them to divorce app logic from DB or modify schema. Well, you need to build your systems in such a way that you can push the database changes out independently from the application deployments. And, and that, again, again, that's an architectural thing. But you know, yeah. this this goes back to what we're saying about you know separating release and deployment being able to deploy constantly, run experiments in production, gather data, change our requirements based on the customer behavior we're seeing. This is where you're really at the top level of continuous delivery. This is the stuff that just gets me so excited right now. So excited. I mean, if we just back up, we look at uh, just basic Agile, lowercase Agile. What's the first thing that people drop off their stories? What's the value of this story? We're changing it when we're doing this. We're doing hypothesis-driven delivery. One of the questions is, how will we measure if this was useful? Um, you don't have to. You don't have to assign the value to it. You decide how you're going to measure it, and you let the data tell you if it's valuable. And then you figure out: Do you want to go down this feature, feature tree further, or is this a good investment or a bad investment? I love it. I think it's fantastic. And that that really is where the state of the art is at the moment. So, more questions. We've got a bunch of questions on here and on Twitter. So, uh, do you agree that without any kind of IT governance in the development team? <coughs> In the development team process, it's almost impossible to have any kind of CD uh, without any kind of IT governance in the development team. So this is where it would be really great to have Joanne on the call because she is the uh, IT governance person. Um, I think governance is a big topic. Um, I think the crucial thing about governance is, I mean, governance falls into two pieces. There's sure. performance and conformance. Conformance is making sure you're not breaking anything, violating any laws, like exposing user data or anything like that. And performance is making sure you're investing your money wisely. Are we getting a good return on our IT investments? If our IT investments are returning us less than forty, less than four percent, why don't we take the money we put into IT and invest it in index-linked funds instead? Uh, because we're not seeing the return. So there's all these elements to, to governance. But generally, what people mean when they talk about governance is are we going to get sued? Are we going to get sued? Are we going to, you know, Sarbanes Oxley, PCI DSS, uh, how do you do things like that? Um, and I think, you know, the nice thing about implementing, say, a deployment pipeline is that a deployment pipeline gives you all this fabulous information 
that actually enables you to be very good about compliance and auditing. By implementing a continuous deployment pipeline, a deployment pipeline, you get you know, information on which changes have been through which parts of the process, which tests have been run against each change, where is each version, it. which version of the software has been deployed, where, what's in every environment, where does it come from, um, all this information that auditors really love and care about is in, is is available as a byproduct of implementing a continuous uh, as a byproduct of implementing a deployment pipeline. So we did a project. Um, actually, we can talk about this publicly for the National Broadband Network in Australia, which is a very heavily regulated industry, providing broadband to everyone in Australia. Um, and they were able to implement a very lightweight change management process, where basically they they had continuous integration using Go. Um, and any time they wanted to make a change in the infrastructure, it was done using Puppet, they would do a Puppet dry run and give you the list of all the things that would happen on the boxes if you right. press the button to deploy it. And that automatically created a ticket in the change management process. Uh, and then when that was authorized, you could then promote that, those infrastructure changes through a pipeline to the various environments. And when Puppet ran, it would run a tool which got the new configuration in the environment and automatically updated the CMDB with the configuration of those environments. So it was end to end. It was it integrated the CMDB, the change management process with the deployment pipeline. It was very easily auditable. And I think you know the, the point of a change management process. The reason change management processes are heavyweight is because because no one can see what's going on. You have to put all these heavyweight controls into place. But if you can see what's going on, if you have some level of validation about the effects of the changes you're going to make. If you can assess the risks of the changes you're going to make, which is what the deployment pipeline sure. does, then you can very everything becomes very transparent, and you can have a much lighter process that is entirely compatible with ITIL. ITIL has the concept of standard changes that are pre-approved. You have a deployment pipeline that tells you which changes are going to be low risk. Those can be standard changes that are pre-approved. Not everyone has to be present at every CAB meeting. CAB approvals can be done electronically. This can all be tied into the deployment pipeline. You know, a lightweight governance process is completely consistent with both ITIL and continuous delivery if you do it like that. So uh, another way to look at this, I guess, would be if you're actually in a, an environment where governance is extremely important to you, your regulated environment or whatever, having a someone from the, the auditing team or whatever the, the, the places you have to have compliance with the performance side of things on the team is actually really useful because they can actually help you plan out the deployment pipeline to automatically capture those gates and, and look for ways to do them automatically. Auditors, Reduce the friction. Auditors really like this stuff, you know, assuming they know what they're doing. And actually finding the auditors, talking to them, showing them some of this stuff, that can make a lot of these problems go away before they even become a So problem. collaboration helps. Who, who would have thought? Wow. <laughs> it's, it's uncanny. So uh, question six. In level four, deployment pipeline automatically rejects bad changes from version control. Any tools or resources you can recommend for implementing a pipeline with this? We've got SVN commits to Jenkins build running automated testing that haven't come across or built anything to roll back failed changes, plus notifications. So there's a great story. Um, the team who built the uh, HP LaserJet firmware, oh, yeah. um, there's a book called, what's it called, Large Scale Agile Development. It's by a guy called Gary Gruber. Go to Amazon, look for Gruber, G R U B E R. Fabulous book about, Fabulous how the, about how the laser jet team moves to continuous delivery. This is for embedded software, for firmware. They move to continuous delivery. 400 developers checking in um, uh, 75,000 to 100,000 lines worth of changes every day, distributed across three countries, Brazil, USA, and India. Uh, and they move to a continuous deployment a continuous delivery model for firmware for laser jets. Uh, and one of the things they did is they built a very powerful deployment pipeline. I think I can probably get this on screen. Uh, let's see. Let's but on that note, too, they're actually they're they're not just the basic CD. They're doing things like feature toggles with firmware and tying all this in together, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, so that's, that's fabulous. So here, I think you can probably see my screen. Hopefully you can see my screen. So here's the deployment pipeline that the HP LaserJet team implemented. And you can see in stage one, uh, they run tests locally against, <coughs> against their Git branch. And then what happens is if the test passes, it gets checked into trunk on Git. 
And then stage two, they gather up all the commits since the last good build, and they run a build against um, all the commits since the last good stage two test run. And if that's a roll-up, yeah, it's a roll-up. And if those tests fail, the check-ins that went into that went in since the last good stage two run are automatically rejected out of Git. They're automatically uncommitted from Git. So um, they built their own tooling to do all this stuff. Git, it's pretty easy to revert things out. I mean, one of the, quote, features, unquote, of Git is that you can change history. Um, I don't know if they, they did it this way, but um, they, they basically built their own tooling to do this. Now, you know, so, so if you commit something and it breaks trunk, it's not, you know, there's no discussion, or oh, maybe we need to get this feature in, it's really important. No, your stuff gets automatically reverted out of version control. Level two tests, that's a test suite that's run uh, against every build that passes level one. That takes two hours, and that's run on a virtual environment that simulates the printers. And if those pass, then level three tests are run, uh, again, takes two hours, on, a, on logic boards that emulate the printer. So they're actually booting the logic boards, downloading the latest firmware build, running that firmware on the logic boards, running tests for two hours on the logic boards, end-to-end -end acceptance tests, uh, and this is a classic deployment pipeline applied to hardware. We're getting yeah. more and more production-like environments as they walk down the thing and getting greater and greater confidence. Absolutely. This is fabulous. So em embedded systems. And so uh, because, uh, and, uh, and then any bills that pass level three go to level four. Level four is their entire regression suite. 30,000 hours worth of automated end-to-end -end tests that run on logic boards uh, once a night. Uh, so their entire regression suite runs once a night. Um, and they are constantly moving tests between the different stages. If a test is passing all the time, they move it down from level one to level two or level three. Tests that fail in level two or level three, they move up to level one, so they're constantly curating their test suites. And, and bringing the pain forward. And bringing the pain forward. And so because of that, they get about a 95 to 98% pass rate in level two and level three, because most of the problems are caught in level one. They make sure the tests that fail regularly are in level one. Um, 400 developers checking in 75 to 100,000 lines of code changes a day, uh, about 150 check-ins a day, and they are getting 10 to 14 good builds of the firmware a day. Now, this is really interesting to me because I get a lot of questions from people about, does continuous delivery scale? And I think, you know, yes, there's larger teams than 400, but 400 on embedded software, trunk -based, that's huge. Trunk-based development. Yeah, there's the answer. Yes, it does scale. So I'm going to not screen share anymore. Uh, deployment pipeline automatically. So we don't know of any tools around this. People who you know built their own hooks into version control to do it. I mean, the good thing with subversion, you can you can revert out a change pretty quickly. It doesn't remove it from history. It's just you know it's a reverse merge. You could script it pretty straightforward. So wow, I think we're running short on time here. But uh, okay. There's a whole discussion going on Twitter, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we probably have to wrap up. We've gone 50 minutes over time. Um, our Twitter handles are on here. Uh, mm -hmm. If you want to get in touch with us, um, I'm Jez, J-E-Z, at ThoughtWorks.com. And I'm T. Brown at ThoughtWorks.com. Feel free to get in touch. Uh, please do check out the Forrester Report. Uh, it's a really fabulous bit of work. Um, we think the material is really nice. 26 pages of lots and lots of information. You should have a couple. Diagrams, pictures, get it yourself. Uh, ThoughtWorks does custom sort of development. We are in a ton of countries all over the world. Uh, we do assessments of how you're doing a continuous delivery, uh, where we come in and look at how you're doing and help you get better at doing it. We do custom software development. We build tools to help with um, continuous delivery mingle for uh, agile project management. Go for continuous delivery and twist for automated testing. Um, Check out 4x-studios.com or 4 uh, Thanks very much for joining in today. Thank you. Uh, we're fun to work with, too. Yeah, and we're hiring. <laughs> I, think, I think we got in everything, though. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>